Good evening. Welcome Good to evening. Canadian Technology. We connect the global community with news, information, and resources that we hope to help improve your life. I'm Stu Reed, here with my co-host, Dave Burstein. Hey, Dave. Hello. And we've got a very special guest with us today, William Fortune, who's a professor of history and a faculty fellow at Montreat College in Montreat, North Carolina. Uh, the professor has received his doctorate from Purdue University. He's published numerous uh, popular novel, novels and nonfiction works about military and alternate history, thrillers, and speculative events. And uh, before we came on, uh, uh, Bill, if it's okay if I call you Bill. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, welcome to the show. I think you Thank mentioned you. you had written 51 books. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, and my analogy I gave you before, writing books is like pistachio nuts. You just can't eat one. You got to go back and do it again. <laughs> Sooner or later, you'll hit something that's successful. Uh huh. Well, you know what? What grabbed my attention, Bill, uh, was uh, a couple of books that you wrote uh, about EMPs, and I'm going to want you to explain what that is. And just by way of background, and for our our listeners and viewers uh, here at WHCR Radio in Harlem, we have something called the WHCR Emergency Broadcast Team. And uh, we help folks prepare for and mitigate and recover from uh, disasters and, and emergency events. We're having a big event on Thursday, uh, September 28th on the campus of City College called the Harlem Emergency Prepar Preparedness Day. And some of the, uh, a couple of the books that you wrote have to do with some really incredible emergencies, uh, events that could happen with uh, EMP events. Maybe you can explain to us what an EMP is and, and how you came to write. I guess the, the books, the first is called One Second After, written mm -hmm. in uh, 2009 about an electromagnetic pulse, EMP. And then your second book is, uh, not your second book, but a follow-up to that is One Year After. So, Bill, if you would tell us a little bit about EMP, how you came to write this books, and, and, and the background on that. Okay, let's do EMP first electromagnetic pulse weapon. What it is, if you loft a small nuclear warhead, maybe a ballistic missile at 200 miles above the Earth's atmosphere, when it detonates, it sets up an electrostatic discharge called the Compton, C-O-M-P-T-O-N, the Compton effect. It's like a giant electric, you know, uh, electronic shock. Hits the Earth's surface at the speed of light, feeds into all our wiring, which are also antennas, it shorts the grid out. Worst case scenario, three such weapons, Eastern, Central, Western United States, blankets the electrical grid of the United States, shorts it out. According to a DOE study several years back, 80% of the grid would still be offline five years later. And here's the bad one. Let's slow down there because you just threw a number out that doesn't make sense to come. It has no common sense, but I believe is accurate. Yes, it is. Five years later, we couldn't have fixed the damage. We could not. Because amongst other things, 90% of our major components in our electrical grid are not manufactured in the United States. Guess where they are? China. China, of course. And the other bad, the really frightening number here is we lose our electrical grid, according to, again, some congressional studies, 80 to 90 percent of the American population would perish in a year to two years after such an event because we lose our water, our command and control, our food supply, our medication, nursing homes, all of that goes offline people start dying. It's bad, isn't it? Yeah, that, 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 that's scary. Yeah, break down a little bit in a little more detail for, for me and our list of exactly what the, the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse does. Is it destroy the components in our, uh, uh, in our systems? Uh, so then they, they basically don't operate. So it will knock out what radio, TV, uh, cell towers, uh, would, server, oh. would servers go down? Would the internet go down? What would impact would it have on the internet? Well, electricity is the fundamental building block of our society for the last 130 years. Mm -hmm. 
think about it. You pull the electricity offline because of the shorting out of major components. <clears throat> One of the bad things is high tension lines would overload and actually start melting off the poles. So what happens is, well, I'll ask you, where did you get your water this morning? When you got up, where did it come from? Uh, well, you know, I got a, a picture of water that I, uh, pictures of water that I keep in, in, in the fridge, have a bottle of water that we purchase, and then, of course, there's tap water. Yeah, and you kept it in the fridge, but even that's gone because it, it is like, the nearest I can compare it to is you got a brand new TV, new computer, and a lightning bulb that's next to your house. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. It just blows the grid out. Mm -hmm. You don't have the replacement parts. So think about New York City three days in where the water supply is gone because the pumping stations all the way up in the Catskills are gone. <clears throat> They're not working anymore. Average city has about 20 to 25 days worth of food on hand. That's what's in your, your freezer to what's pulling into the local market. All of that is gone. What happens? And the big one as well, the pharmacies are all shut. The gas stations are shut. They don't work anymore. What do you do? That's where you're, you're important in doing this emergency broadcasting system. To try and get people more aware of stockpiling. And I don't mean like some crazy you know, survivalist. <clears throat> Just stockpiling basic essentials to get you through a month or so could be very crucial in your survival. Mm -hmm. Stu, you yes, did please. some lot of reporting about what happened when Puerto Rico was yes, that's a great by example. the weather. And in, for, as I remember, the electricity was down and people couldn't keep their insulin cold. That's Do I remember right. that right? You got it absolutely right. And in my book, One Second After, uh, my main character, his daughter is a type one diabetic. He's desperate just to get a couple of refrigerated dial, uh, vials, but the refrigeration isn't working anymore. This is a cascading series of events, which is just frightening to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, let, me, let me ask you, but would, would things like, would, would batteries continue to work? I mean- no, Yes, they would. Yes, they would. So yes. battery operated device, so electricity itself is not disabled. I don't no. know how that would be. This is... It's a distribution system. Right, okay. It's a system from the, re you know, the refinery, pumping there, that requires electricity, getting the fuel to the refineries, or you know, all of it just starts going offline. And then, it, like I said, it cascades out. Mm -hmm. So would, would the batteries uh, back up that cell tower, would that work for the three or four days that they are uh, capable of providing service? Would that continue to operate? Maybe, mm -hmm. but you got it right there. After three or four days, it yeah, it's off. gone. Yeah, yeah. Gone. Your cell phone doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Even your cell phones might be affected, but even if they're not, the transmission towers are hard. Mm -hmm. And then how do you how do you recharge them after the batteries die out? Well, see, there's the problem because we don't have stockpiled in place key components to bring the system back online. You know, we're spending a trillion dollars on green energy, and I support a lot of that, but we're not spending money on the basic nuts and bolts of upgrading our system. Our system is about a 1970s to 1980s system of transmission. We have to upgrade it to a modern system with better fail safes, better circuit breakers, things like that, to be able to survive such an attack. Mm -hmm. Or to really spook you, the sun could do the same thing in a major solar storm. You say the sun? Yeah, the sun, the sun, sun could do the same thing. Look it up. It's called the Carrington, Carrington event that happened in 1859, where it blew out the Victorian internet of its day. It blew out the telegraphy systems. Now, this is a very overbuilt system. If it could do that then, what would happen now? Mm. And what are the predictions of another one? Well, CMEs are happening every single day. If you look up a site called spaceweather.com, very up to date, sooner or later, we will be hit by another major you know, CME. It could be 10 years, it could be 50 years. I don't like betting on that. Mm -hmm. 
So how, how do we harden some of our facilities? Uh, you're saying that money is not being spent. How, how, what would you propose that the government and that the industry do to, to harden the facilities against this kind of catastrophe? Yeah, that's a great question. You need better circuit breaking systems. You know, the circuit breaker you have on your computer, you know, the power strip right now. Mm -hmm. uh, these are vastly different than the ones we had 30 or 40 years ago. They have to be very high speed, but we're not putting those into our electrical grid. Better circuit breaking systems, more robust shielding on major components. These are the two major things we need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in in your book, I, I read uh, that uh, your analogy was that uh, if if an, uh, uh, this kind of uh, electromagnetic pulse event were to happen and electricity were to be disabled or electrical devices were to be disabled, mm -hmm. as, as, as you talk about in your novel, that we would have to rely on 16th century technology. Kind of br break that down on a practical basis, what, what that would mean. For all of us, electricity worked yesterday. It works today. We don't even think about it, you know? Turn the faucet on in the morning, the, the water runs. Do this, do that. All of it works. I call it the expectation of normalcy. Worked yesterday, worked today, will work tomorrow. Suppose it doesn't. We have to start thinking about that. So bringing us up to a modern system is one, but if we lose it, it's not like we're going to be thrown back 120, 130 years. You know, a good friend of mine recently passed away, a major expert on this, used to say, you know, it'd be like being back in 1870. But remember this, the people who lived in 1870 knew how to live in 1870. That was the high tech of their day. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to run a steam engine or... or you know, plow a field or all the things that people did then. So it would be the equal of being thrown back 500 or 1,000 years. But all or deliver a baby. What? Or deliver a baby or book yes. your home. And during the break, I'm going to look up that original quote. It's yeah. from Heine. Yeah. How many people know how to deliver a baby without any medication or equipment on hand? Mm-hmm. I, so, got, I imagine a few midwives, but 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 not, it's not a big population. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. See, there's the scary part. The hospitals might be able to run for a couple of days on battery bag systems, or even if their their local generator works. When I started writing these books, my father was in a nursing home, and I remember we had a huge power blowout because of a hurricane. I went to the nursing home, and I'm sitting there with the director. My father was on a respirator, but they had an emergency backup. And I asked her, what do we do? What's going to happen to dad a day or two from now? And she said, he'll die. What happens to Alzheimer's patients? Uh, we're all dealing with that, either, you know, parents or grandparents. Most Alzheimer patients have a little anklet that's an electronic door lock. They don't work anymore how the nurses get to the nursing home in the hospital when their cars might not work, or even if they do, there's no way to get fuel. This, this keeps getting into some very deadly type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit, Bill, about how solar and wind power might help ameliorate some of this uh, impact of this kind of disaster scenario. Well, it, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm very much in favor of solar, I'm not so sure about wind, but remember, solar and wind, they still need the distribution system to take the electricity from the windmill across high tension lines to the distribution net. But if those wires short off and go down, the windmill can spin, but the electricity isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Same thing with solar. Mm -hmm. How about, how about lo local solutions? Uh homes, apartment buildings, small communities that, that have that kind of backup power? They'll have the backup power, <clears throat> hopefully. Though, again, they are all vulnerable to the system. The problem is everything else around you is going down and not coming back up. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's command and control. You know, bad guys might start to realize, gee, the cops aren't working anymore. They can't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine was responsible for trying to get the phone company working again after Katrina. Yeah. And, oh, was that a problem? Yes. Yeah. What about Sandy? Did both of you guys go through Sandy? Yes, we did. That that, that Sandy was the impetus for us getting together in Harlem. Sure. With the Tell me about it. Team. How come? Uh, be, uh, we were at the radio station, and the mm -hmm. radio station uh, uh, personalities, the, 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 the programmers could not get into the station because of flooding in right. Harlem that we didn't even know that we had these flood zones in Harlem. So mm -hmm. the personnel, the on-air personnel, couldn't even get to the station to talk about what was happening. So uh, we had to go on auto programming after a day or so. We had to go on auto programming because the people couldn't get into the station uh, to run it. And even if they could get into the station, the, the, the communication breakdown between what was going on out in the community and at the station, we didn't have the connectivity. That's right. So that, that's why we started a whole mobile radio network, a whole walkie-talkie network that, that works independent of the grid and independent of the, uh, the, the the phone network grid. Well, that's, I mean, you are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate hearing this because we need more groups, people, universities doing this type of thing of putting together communications networks making sure they survive an EMP or a CME or even a natural disaster. But remember with Sandy, help was coming in from all over the country to try and help, you know, the recovery process. But imagine if there is no help coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it's scary. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, Dave. I mean, Dave. Uh, before we go to the break, I found found the classic quote. Robert Heinlein was a great science fiction writer who he was thought one about, of it was incredible. He's the mm -hmm. godfather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he thought about what would happen in if this, if that. He's famous for 1942 having two FBI agents come to his home and ask him, how did he fi find out what he wrote in a short story in a science fiction magazine mm -hmm. that uh, essentially predicted Los Alamos a few years before? <laughs> yeah. So he was thinking about what could go wrong and what should he do, and said, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, and so on. And of course, to deliver a baby, if necessary. Mm -hmm. I remember Robert and, Highland was threatened with being shipped off to North Dakota if he ever said another word about it. Well, <laughs> about, about what? <laughs> uh, the, the, the gentleman <laughs> was pointing out it was early 42, the war was on, mm -hmm. and I'm also L. Sprague, the camp was writing some stuff on this. FBI visits them, you're never to write about this again, and I think it was Sprague, the camp, who joked, why, are we making a bomb? <laughs> 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 and it was like, you say another word, you're going to North Dakota for the duration. <laughs> Whoa, wow. Yeah, because the, the theory came out in public science, it was available, the, the theory was available in the scientific literature, and Heinlein just followed that. You know what, the it, theory that an A-bomb could be bomb. made, that's what we're talking about, right? The theory of yeah. an A-bomb? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, ha what happens if it fissions and how you can get a chain reaction? Mm -hmm. It was yeah. making a chain reaction that was really the breakthrough. At that point, people like Albert Einstein got really afraid that it would happen. And they knew that in Germany, Werner Heisenberg was yes. going to have a program on it. And they respected Heisenberg's ability, although it turned out they didn't get that together in Germany, thankfully. Thankfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have to take a break now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is some fascinating stuff. Uh, this is Community and Technology. We're talking with Professor Bill Fortune. Uh, am I saying your name right, Bill? Yeah, it's close enough. Just call me Bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
We're talking with Bill. He's a professor at uh, Montreal College in Montreal, North Carolina. He received his doctor from Purdue University, and he's written 51 books. Uh, a couple that we're talking about today that focus on what happens if there's an uh, EMP event, an electromagnetic, ma electromagnetic pulse disruption that mm -hmm. knocks out electricity. Uh, it could be very local, could be widespread. Fascinating stuff. Uh, so we're going to uh, take a brief break and be right back. This is Community of Technology on WHCR 90.3 FM. Stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, we're back. Community Technology on WHR 90.3 FM. Stewie Day Burstein, special guest Bill Fortune, professor of history and a faculty fellow at Montreal College in Montreal, North Carolina. And we've been talking about uh, electromagnetic pulses 
and the effect that those might have on, on the U.S. on society in general in terms of debilitating the whole electric grid and electrical devices. And um, uh, where are we going to go with that, Dave? I, I know that you want to get in well, on the, the conversation. First thing, before I ask him the question, yes. why don't you tell us the names of the books where you talked about what would happen to America if nuclear weapons had wiped out our electricity? Well, picture, we no longer have electricity. Everything gone is gone. I call it a Maslow hierarchy of needs. Where are you going to get your water? Where are you going to get your food when food isn't being distributed? Where are you going to get your medication when the pharmacies no longer work because their, their grid is down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a big concern for me is, you know, what about nursing homes and hospitals? That's a very scary part of this scenario because three quarters of the staff is never going to show up because transportation is down. What happens to the million plus people in assisted living and nursing homes? They're goners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me throw the question at, we've been talking about what happens if a nuclear weapon knocked out the grid. And let's bring that to today. Okay. It certainly is possible for the Russians to explode a small nuclear bomb mile above Kiev. It would have to be about 100, at least 100 miles up to fully set up an EMP. One, it's in heavy atmosphere down here. The, the, the effect is line of sight only and very limited. In the thinner atmosphere, the effect becomes more powerful. But yes, you could take out Kiev with one of these. Well, yeah. Let me just jump in here, clarification. So you don't necessarily have to have a nuclear explosion on the ground where property and people get destroyed. You it's can do it that. in the it's air where there's no property right. destroyed, per se. Right. Don't right. have this EMP effect. Is that right, Bill? Right. It has to be an air burst. Ideal is about 200 miles up. The very thin atmosphere accelerates the breakdown a uh, molecular breakdown that sets up an electrostatic discharge. Because remember, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, even the test in the early 50s, EMP wasn't fully realized until 1962 when we decided to lay off the one and a half megaton weapon 200 miles up over uh, Johnson Island. When it blew, it shorted out Hawaii. And then suddenly it's like, my God, what is this? Russians did it as well that year, Soviet test 184, same thing. That's one we all start to realize. EMP is what we would call, you know, military people would call an asymmetrical first strike. All you need and, is that to block your opponent. And what would happen if that happened above Kiev today? Yeah. First, describe what, it's, what it would do on the ground and to the country. Everything blacks out. Since Everything? Just, well, you know, your electrical grid is gone. So the whole system just starts to short out within the first couple of seconds. That's all you really need. Because once you've destroyed that, you've destroyed all of the infrastructure that is dependent upon electricity to keep things running. So that is far, far more effective than doing a ground burst weapon the way we did in Hiroshima in 1945. Now, let's again bring it to today. The Russian, if the Russians did that and they said, oh, this is not a reason to start a nuclear war. We well, didn't kill anybody with this. Uh, how, sh how should or how would the Ukrainians, Europeans and Americans respond? God, you're asking. For one thing, the genie's out of the bottle. The Pandora's box is open. Neither side, nobody has used a nuclear weapon since 1945. Once one person or one entity does it, does that not accelerate the probability that a second one will use it and then a third? One of the areas we have to look at is between Pakistan and India. They've been nose to nose for 40 years. They fought a couple of wars. They both have nuclear weapons. Something happens over Islamabad or Delhi. 
you know, those are the type of scenarios that suddenly start expanding to everybody using it. You know, Israel, that could be another one. You know, they, they just, my fear is once you open the door to nuclear weapons, you're not going to close it. It will become more and more common. That's mm -hmm. that. I met a fellow who was thinking about that pretty seriously. Happened mm -hmm. to go out with his daughter. Herman Kahn. Herman Kahn. Was the model for Dr. Strangelove. Yes. Wrote on the mm -hmm. nuclear warfare and thinking about the unthinkable and on escalation. And that became the pattern. This is going back to 50s and 60s. It's 1960. Yeah. That was... The model for the U.S. and the Russians looking each other in the face, unfortunately, not blowing up the world. Is that a realistic worry? If some, if the Russians used a bomb, even if it didn't kill people directly, are we going to go to full-scale nuclear war? What might happen? I was just actually I was just reading an article yesterday on the various crises that happened during the Cold War. We came within a hair's breadth on at least half a dozen different occasions. The Cuban Missile Crisis in '62 could have gone new, except for one submarine commander, Soviet submarine commander, that refused to release a weapon. 1983, Soviets picked up a rocket being launched off the coast of Norway. For about 15 minutes, they were thinking, my God, this is it. We have to mobilize out. Remember, Jack Kennedy said it's not nuclear war by calculation. It is nuclear war by miscalculation, accident, or madness that I'm afraid of. And he's right. I still am. We should all be. Hmm. Now, we're talking about crises. There's an ongoing crisis between China and Taiwan. Right. That's been on the edge of war for a long time. Uh, but especially the last two or three years, people like Australian Defense Minister have been saying, that's going to become a war. We have to prepare to send troops. So I have no idea what's real and what's not and what's going to happen. But serious people are very worried. I am afraid of China, of course, but North Korea is the entity that I'm really concerned about because it's a rogue nation with a madman running the country. What's the prevent? Let's say he finds out he's terminal. He decides, oh, the hell with it. I'll take the U.S. out as I go out the door. So North Korea is a big concern. But Taiwan, Taiwan would be, it's a very defendable place. The Chinese ever invaded it, it would be it would be a madhouse. It would be a bloodbath. It's a big island, very mountainous. Again, it would be another Ukraine ten times over. But yeah, if they went nuke, what? Are, who's the response? Us? Okay, you do that to uh, Taiwan. We're going to do that to Canton. No, because then the escalation just runs away. And these are real fears. Yes. And one of the reasons that we may be on the edge of war there, in fact, we actually are at war there, including two people quoted in the New York Times. Yes. At the moment, it's an economic war, and we're blockading the most important technology in the world and keeping it from going to China. Right. And blockade, is that an act of war? How, sh well, how should this... Chinese think of it? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? Actually, before, let me introduce. The reason I'm asking our guest, Bill, that question is he did some books about Pearl Harbor. And the Japanese point of view said they didn't start World War II in the Pacific. The United States did by blockading the oil Japan needed for its, its weaponry. What's the effect of a blockade? Is it an act of war? How, how should the Chinese respond? Well, remember, 1917, we finally got sucked into World War I because Germany announced unrestricted submarine warfare 
uh, setting up a perimeter around Britain. We were essentially running the blockade in 1941. The point, blockade is like semi-war. Are you going to use that finally as a provocation to go to a full war? Uh, and even in 1962, we announced the blockade of Cuba. The Russians were saying that was an act of war. That, that, that's a very good question to ask. Is a blockade a war? Mm -hmm. And there's and, a lot of that happening in the Middle East, too, is it not? In Palestine, a lot of the... the oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a common step up to war. Mm-hmm. And, and and Dave, I just want to interject. Uh, you know, it's one thing to blockade technology, but then it's another to blockade basic uh, food and medical supplies and basic stuff that folks need just to survive. Which I know is happening in Palestine and some other places that, uh, around the planet. Uh, Iran, mm -hmm. Venezuela, Cuba, mm -hmm. and certainly Syria, uh, North Korea. And it certainly happened to Iraq under Saddam. Mm -hmm. and in terms of what is the impact? Well, some British academics who presumably have strong feelings, but have some right to be respected for their opinions, figured that about 200,000 people died from starvation, malnutrition, resulting medical problems and so on because of the blockade that we did of Iraq. Mm. I don't think it was quite that bad in Iran. Iran was actually, has a lot of facilities and even a lot of industry. Uh, but we know in Venezuela, people were desperately dying because they couldn't get antibiotics two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. We didn't send a ship down there. We just made sure that Venezuela couldn't sell the oil and didn't have enough money to buy the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Is that war? Is it? Well, you're the fellow who wrote the book about Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that my book, Pearl Harbor, actually, I think two thirds of the book was about before World War II and mainly from the Japanese viewpoint of they finally felt that it was an act of war when in June 1941, we blockaded oil because the Japanese were going to run out of oil within six months, which would have meant the collapse of their war in China. Therefore, they declared war on us to keep the war in China going and look at the result. Hmm. That, that, that's yeah. something I know very few Americans know, know about, Bill. You know, we, we kind of think of World War II, and particularly the Japanese involvement, as a reaction to Pearl Harbor. And right. what you're saying is that Pearl Harbor didn't come out of uh, uh, nowhere. Out of the blue. That they were pro provoked into that, in a sense. Well, yeah. Uh, too many Americans think that, what do we want to do today? Let's bomb Pearl Harbor. That's how most of us envisioned the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. It was a long series of escalations across the previous 10 years, and we did woefully misstep on some of those. Not to say Pearl Harbor was even remotely justified, but from the Japanese viewpoint, it was. But even then, their top commander, Yamamoto, was saying, I can give you six months of victory, but if their full forces are deployed out against us, we're going to lose. They said they stood. They thought they stood one chance in ten of maybe getting to pull it off and then do a separate piece with us. They couldn't. And that's why I took this discussion to what's happening in Taiwan, because the United States is blocking the technology China needs for everything, from artificial intelligence to satellites to basic computers for people in the office. And that to me seems a very dangerous move first to take. And it's not gonna work because people born in Shenzhen or in Shanghai are just as smart as those born in San Jose and, mm -hmm. and San Diego. And it will it's affecting them. They lost $30 billion worth of sales of Huawei phones and so on. 
but the Chinese are going to be able to build whatever they need to. Yeah. There's a lot of very smart people in China. <laughs> so, so, okay. so, Dave, what, you know, you're saying that one, the embargo, uh, technology embargo against China, is uh, somewhat debilitating, could be considered an act of war. But you're also saying that they are resilient and resourceful enough that they will figure things out despite the embargo. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah. And I know that's happening and we're spending the last six months on artificial intelligence where in a lot of ways, the Chinese have caught up with us. Chat GPT is famous here. Well, Baidu has some software that can match it. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's six large language models that I know of mm -hmm. in China, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Huawei, that are for practical purposes just as good as what we have in the United States. But we they cannot in China buy the most advanced chips for it. So they're going to have to figure out a way to make them. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be interested in, in your thinking, Bill. I, I know you have written a lot about uh, military strategy and alternate history. Do you have any sense or maybe, you know, you, you can... Uh, speculate about what some of your next uh, uh, writing is going to be about how AI is going to play into the whole <laughs> military and geopolitical uh, arena. Well, my latest book, Five Years After, came out a couple of weeks ago. You want to know something? I don't want to write about it again for a long time. It can be a pretty depressing topic. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, just regarding chat, GTP, I teach college. Two weeks ago, I assigned my students to use chat to do a simple paper on the Declaration of Independence. They brought them all in. I could not tell the difference between an actual essay and what a computer can now do. In fact, I canceled all writing assignments for the rest of the semester. <clears throat> We're going to a different format because that's the future. You know, my, my kids have to sign a pledge. They're not going to use it. But come on, three o'clock in the morning. I was a grad student once. <laughs> I had an assignment at eight in the morning for 10 pages and I hadn't even started. I hit that chat GBT button. Who wouldn't? Yeah. You know? Well, the technology is quite so good right. enough what? for a lot of things right now. I run all, I run all my stuff. Through well, I'm, I'm using Claude instead of ChatGPT because it's better style, mm -hmm. and it'll find some grammatical errors. It will occasionally suggest a better sentence, but frankly, they're both lousy writers. They're very dull. Of course, student term papers you don't expect to be. Oh, try read a hundred student writers. term papers. <laughs> talk about dull yeah right <laughs> yeah. talk about wanting to go to the scotch at four o'clock on sunday afternoon yeah 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 so, wikipedia is much better at this point than chat gpt nine times out of ten mm -hmm. and i say that having looked at both because i often when i'm writing about say a chinese company uh, I will go see the Wikipedia and put it at the bottom of the article I wrote for people who want more information. I tried doing that with what I got out of Claude, but too much of it was too general. Yeah. 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 Not quite up to what I said. Now, that'll probably be fixed sometime oh. soon. Hmm. Oh, it already is. I mean, my kids, I were, my kids were teaching me two weeks ago about this. And I just set their gate mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, know, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. What's hitting you now ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> yeah, what's hitting now is not just text, but pictures, yeah. illustrations, music of professional quality, not good professional quality, but good enough to pass. Uh and the video now. It doesn't make it more than about 15 seconds of inequality, but that's going to be solved. Yes. And that's going to change the world in a lot of ways. But that's a different show. Yes, it is. And I would love to talk about this more because, and if, you know, I'm a college professor first, I'm a writer second. It's having a profound impact on what I do. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you mean by that. 
Well, I've already had to restructure my classes. I mean, when I first started teaching college 30 years ago, I would take the kids to the library and show them how to use a card index. When was the last time we did anything like that? It's changing so rapidly. And my, my one really smart student was showing me, you can even program in mistakes to make it look like it's a student's paper. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, only maybe. The, it's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that very heavily now in illustration. Yeah. You can turn around and say, make this look like a Vermeer. Make this yes. look like a Van Gogh. Make this look like a Jackson Pollock. Make this look like a Blue Period Picasso. Yes. And it probably won't be as creative, as brilliant as Picasso did, but it's going to look a lot like it. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's that's where we're headed. Well, we'd certainly like to have you back, Bill, to talk about I would love to come back with you guys. This is yeah. weird. I mean, just to hang out and talk. I, I'm, mm -hmm. Sir, yet again, I am impressed with what you're doing with your uh, emergency broadcasting system. Um, you're the first person I've talked to who's doing something like that. Mm -hmm. We need a nationwide network. And people have to be prepared. If people would just do a basic preparation on some food, water, if they're on medication, make sure you got a month's supply on hand because you learned it 12 years ago with Sandy. Mm -hmm. Happens again. Gosh, how long were you down? I know my publisher was down for weeks because they yeah. were down. Yeah, well, most of New York was actually high enough that it wasn't affected. Yeah, but there are some folks out in Far Rockaway. Some of one of the guys that helped initiate our whole program, Bill, uh, he was on a, a mobile radio network listening to some of the calls that were coming in, and um, it, it brought the brought the guy to tears just listening to the yeah. desperation. Folks yes. couldn't uh, no police, no fire, no EMS, no nobody. Water was up two stories up to some of the uh, apartment buildings and uh, the public housing buildings out in, in Far Rockaway, Brooklyn. It was really uh, felt like Armageddon. Yes. And 125th Street at the Hudson River is actually below sea level when you go in about mm -hmm. 100 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, again, I, I want to thank you, Bill, and I, and I appreciate the, 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 the recognition for, for the work that we're doing. Uh, it is important. And uh, yeah. yeah, and and uh, you know we we we're creating community networks. We started off in Harlem. We're doing stuff in in, in the South Bronx and and East Bronx, and we just started creating a uh, a, a community cell in in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know our whole philosophy is that the folks on the ground have to have their own network and the way to communicate. That you can't yeah. count on outside folks and outside experts. It's the regular people have to have to have the resources and the wherewithal to like communicate and take care of each other. That's why, you know, in terms of this whole electrical infra infrastructure thing, it's gonna to have to come from the bottom up. Top yeah. down, <laughs> I don't even want to talk about the federal government. Yeah. It's the bottom up organization that's gonna take us. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thank you. We've been speaking with uh, Professor Bill Fortune, a history professor and faculty fellow at Montreat College in North Carolina, writer of 51 books. And, uh, and in particular, we've been talking about EMP, electromagnetic pulse, and, and emergency preparedness, something that is dear to my heart. So thank you, Bill, for coming on uh, Community Technology. Appreciate you much. God bless, and have a good evening, and keep up the good work, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is Community and Technology. Quick reminder, Thursday, September 28th, noon to 4 p.m., Campus of City College, Harlem Emergency Preparedness Day. Please check us out. Look at our website, whcr.org, for more information. Thanks for tuning in. This has been Community and Technology on WHCR 90.3 FM. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Tune in. Just might learn something. Good night.